Hey everyone, so we recently had the pleasure of sitting down with Kevin Callan, acclaimed author, camper extraordinaire, for a whiskey fireside chat over on his channel. Uh, both Julie and I sat down with him and talked a little bit about what goes into our videos and some of the antics behind making them. Uh, so after you watch this video, which we are jokingly referring to as a kitchen fireside chat with Kevin, which is more about him and his channel, uh, and his camping experiences. Uh, after you enjoy this video, go over to his, subscribe to him, check out his content. Kevin has a wealth of knowledge when it comes to backcountry camping, canoe routes, winter camping, all things camping related. And he's written almost 20 books on the topics. Uh, and ironically enough, we actually had a copy of this en route to us, ordered in the mail when we filmed the piece but Kevin actually brought us a signed copy of it, so now we have an extra copy. We're going to give this away to one lucky viewer in the comments. All you have to do to be entered in the giveaway is simply leave a comment down below, and in about a week I'll choose one lucky viewer uh, to receive this book. But I'll put a link down below to where you can purchase a copy of this as well. Fantastic story about one of the most difficult routes in Algonquin Park, uh, and chock full of uh, Kevin Callan's trademark humor so cannot recommend this book enough check it out um and yeah after this video be sure to go over to kevin's channel subscribe to him uh and enjoy the uh kitchen sorry no the whiskey fireside chat uh with kevin over on his channel so uh without further ado uh here is the video with kevin hey everyone this is kevin callan outdoor canoe camper extraordinaire esteemed author and one of my absolute favorite backcountry campers on YouTube. I, I want to know, how did it all begin? Ooh. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, you know, I've, I've written about the story before, but I, I, to sum it all up, uh, my parents took me out camping. We went car camping, campground camping. We had um, an Apache trailer. Uh, actually, we had another trailer before that, but it leaked. And I remember my dad coming back from the Apache trailer and, oh, this is better, and it leaked, right? But we went to Algonquin and did that. that. My dad and I would go to fishing lodges, a uh, big fisherman, um, angler. And, you know, he had no... Oh, man, I, this is weird because, um, yeah, I thought a lot about my dad the last couple of days. But my dad uh, would take me out a lot. In fact, he even take me out of school to go on, on fishing trips. Yeah. I thought that was really cool. Where back in the day, like I was, I went to school where Sister Alexander would hit you with a freaking ruler. I, I'm left handed and they try to make me right handed oh, wow. by hitting me with a ruler. And I'm not wow. that old. Yeah. <laughs> but I remember my mom coming into school and just going nuts on that. No. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Where are we going from here? Where did it all start? Yeah. Well, yeah. We're like. Yeah. So I went camping a lot as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> my dad took me to fishing lodges. But I do remember I was on Megasin Lake, I think. We, we flew into this one lake in Ogoma uh, between Sault Ste. Marie and Sudbury. Beautiful area. And we were fishing for lake trout on the main uh, lake, you know, with, with the motorboats. Mm -hmm. And we caught nothing. So there was an old Grumman canoe. I'm not sure if you Grumman, the, the yes. aluminum canoe. And we canoed into some side ponds and we caught amazing trout. And I remember I was 12 years old. In fact, I had a t shirt on in the photo saying, um, oh, what's, what's the Saturday Night Live? Uh, oh no, it's Mr. Bill. <laughs> the little plastic. You, yeah, you, you, you wouldn't want to remember that, but <laughs> oh no, it's Mr. Bill. That's that's to date that. So uh, I wrote my journal saying this is the best vessel to get into the wilderness. And what I did then is I connected a vessel that could take you into a wilder place. I had nothing to do with. So I, I didn't really have a problem going in a in a Grumman canoe. So, oh my god <laughs> don't do a whiskey fireside chat and then have oh my lord don't don't go uh go from a, a, a aluminum boat to the crumbling canoe and say oh. well that you that connected more to the wilderness but it did because you actually were able to get to places nobody else could get to because it was a little bit more difficult like you've been on portages right. before right yes it's a little bit more difficult but what you see when you get there is far worth it yes. you catch trout you see wilderness. You hear silence, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I, as in a 12-year-old kid, I was like, I get that. 
And yeah. that whole idea has stuck with me ever since. I, I have no problem with anybody using an ATV or a motorboat or, or whatever to get into the wilderness. I prefer the canoe because I think it's the best vessel ever created to get you into a small tributary, small pond, small lake, and get away from the crowds. And if you actually do meet someone there, and you will, but they've gone through the same ordeal that you have, so you're going to be the same person. Yeah. And what would you say has been the most uh, type 2 fun you've had in all the years that you've been camping? The type 2 fun? Yeah. So the the kind of leading off from where you're talking about, you know, it, those places are difficult to get to. Type 2 fun is sort of like the difficult experiences that you get through that afterwards you reflect on and say that was actually one of the best experiences that you're on or had oh what, what, what is what's the most difficult experience that was also the most rewarding experience afterwards there is tons of them <laughs> uh first time in oh my god uh going solo down the miss Abbey river when i was in my early 20s like what was i yeah. thinking like I read Cliff Jacobson's book and thought I was I knew how to paddle, so therefore right. I I can go down this the, one of the most remote, furthest, longest undammed river in Ontario uh, from Lake Superior all the way to James Bay. Right. As a kid, and yeah. um, going down Devil's Rapids because I I didn't see the portage and so I kept running <laughs> these rapids. I went these are seem a lot difficult and all the Bill Mason videos I don't remember this, uh, and I I got through. And learning from that, though, too. Like, I mean, if you go and do something stupid, that, that's really bad. But if you learn from it, that's called life, right? But yeah. if you do it three or four times and then die, <laughs> it's your own fault, right? But, um, yeah, to go down, go down the, the, oh, my God. I remember I saw eight bears in 11 days on that trip. Oh, my God. And then they weren't bad bears. But I was a kid, right? I was like, <laughs> in fact, actually, before that trip, <laughs> the shuttle driver dropped me off. I remember I was just a young guy with a canoe going down this river thinking, hey, you know, this looks cool. I've read a book about it. Yeah. And the guy goes, yeah, you know, um, so someone just got eaten by a bear. And um, we don't know if we got him or not. We're pretty sure we shot the right bear. But, you know, just to warn you. And I was teaching part time at the college, which I still do nowadays. But I ended up it was one of my past students. He was a geologist. Oh, he got no. he graduated, became a geologist was taking a soil sample, a uh, black bear came up, predaceous bear, uh, and killed him just like a, he would a, a moose calf and took his head off. Oh, and of course they tell me this, the first five minutes of my trip, going 20 days down the Mississippi River to James Bay. Right. And um, the first night, I go to make camp and I r- raise my, my pack up in the tree and it, the rope breaks, falls to the ground, and my Bailey's, my flask of Bailey's breaks and goes all over my gear, my sleeping bag, my clothes. I was like, oh, that's not good. And right across the lake, I see this bear walking along the shore. I went, oh, like, love of God. I mean, nothing happened. It wasn't the same bear. They did kill the bear. They killed him, whatever. But, oh, my goodness. Yeah, I'm going off on tangent. So, no, you, you, you must have been terrified. Uh, I was concerned. <laughs> Actually, the other greatest story, though, what, well, the two, so I remember going down that same river, too, and there was another river that comes into the Missinabi near the end called the Fire River, yeah. and I went up to the tributaries and caught a bunch of brook trout, and I had some brook trout, and I had about, I think, three or four of them on a stringer, and I'm like, oh, great, I'm proud of myself, this is Williams, I've got brook trout, I'm going to, the bushcraft thing, I'm going to eat bushcraft. <laughs> so uh, I would go down, and uh, I, go, I go down to my canoe, and I look behind me, and there's a bear following me along the trail, and this is in the middle of nowhere. Right? right and so seeing a bear in a gonquin it's a it's a bear that actually is trying to get your food seeing a bear following you on a on a bush trail up by james bay that's a little bit more scarier it, it's like hmm, i've never seen a human before but it's got something i want yeah. so i actually gave it two of my fish <laughs> no no <laughs> just two of my fish and then continued on yeah. and i went back to my canoe and that bear was sitting by my canoe waiting for me like mm-hmm. it's like oh, okay well here's all my fish and i left but the coolest thing on that trip, though, too, was I also uh, I was paddling um, down the river, going to James Bay, and on the left shore, there is a wolf. And think about it. I, maybe I was 22 years old, 23 years old, and I see this wolf. Cool. So I get my camera, and I run through the boreal forest trying to get a picture of this wolf, right? Oh, this is exciting. This is what the movie's all done. And uh, then I didn't see the wolf, and all of a sudden I realized, oh, I'm stuck in the boreal forest. Trees all look the same, by the way. Right, right, oh and my, my map and compass is on the 
bow plate of my canoe, not with my body, right? I'm thinking, oh, learn from that. Yeah. And I go, gosh, I got to find my canoe. And sure enough, you know, think back. The sun was rising. It's in the morning. So it's rising the east. So I, I, I walk east, get to the river, find my canoe. So I did find my canoe yeah. and didn't panic. Even though I was in my early 20s, I should have panicked. But um, I get there and... Chris, I, I, I told many, many exaggerated stories in my life, but I remember this day, the wolf is on the opposite shore sitting there looking at me like, you're an idiot. That was a cool story. That's cool awesome. time in, in the bush. Um, other times, the Kopka River. Yeah, we, we do the Kopka River. Uh, Andy and I, we, get, we, we do five days bushwhacking to get the river because we were too cheap to fly in, so we took the trains. We, we And we... We do this amazing river, and it was probably a class one rapid, the very first rapid, mm-hmm. and we almost wedged on a, on, a, on, a, on a log and destroyed everything. Mm-hmm. Um, that was really stupid. Um, yeah, you know what? There has a, if I had to I look at all the negative things, the really dangerous things that ever happened to me, it's all human-based, to be quite honest. Being windbound is tough. And it, well, windbound is not tough if you're out for 20 days and you're windbound for the 18th day you're like well, who cares but if you're going out for three days and you're windbound the second day your your mindset is not set for that and you're like right. you're like come on yeah. and you're, you're fighting nature if you fight nature you're done for right i wouldn't say that to be a negative thing um i i being mean, uh i still get nervous about bears because i read yeah. too much about predaceous bears and it's never going to happen but you know i I'm normal. Like if you're on a solo trip, if I'm on a solo trip for 20 days, um, well, I don't even know it's day 18 when it's day 18, <laughs> if you're on a solo trip, whatever, or you, whatever. But night one, night two, you're still thinking, what am I doing this for? Like, do you yeah. have any friends, Kevin? Like what's going on? And you really think that the bear is going to kill you because you're not comfortable. You're not climatized with, with your surroundings. Right. Yeah. But it's like driving the highway. I'm not afraid of the highway because you're climatized to it, but it's a really dangerous place to be. Yeah. Would you say it's made you a more confident person in general? I think nature travel has made me, I don't know about confident. It made me normal. Um, <laughs> I mean, it makes you, you are who you are in the woods. Yeah. There's no facade yeah. in the woods. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And you see people, you know, when, when you're at work or at school, whatever, you, some a lot of people try that chameleon. They try, try to be someone else to fit in, right. and when you're in the woods, nature doesn't allow you to do, do that. And I love that part. I really love that part about it. Yeah. And um, I'm a high anxiety, so when I'm in the woods, I'm very calm. That's good. And yeah. you know, I I've done trips with, for example, with uh, with students backpacking trips, and in the fall this time of year, and it's and we're out for seven days, and the first few days they're like, oh, this is crazy, and it's really bad weather. And they look at me, they go, Kevin, why are you so calm? I went, really? Yeah. Like, I am so comfortable out here. If yeah. I get uncomfortable, I know how to become comfortable. I know how to get a fire going. I know how to do, like, shelter, whatever. Yeah. And you guys don't. So, and I get that. I'm going to teach you how to be comfortable. But the only way I can teach you how to be comfortable is for you guys to spend the seven days out here with me. Right. You can't do two, three, two or three days and expect to learn from that. Mm-hmm. Um, and you need to do it continuously. It takes you years to be a, a skilled paddler. Um, it, it need it, you know. It, it takes you years to learn that you don't, you know nothing. <laughs> so, which leads me to my next question: what, what do you think the most important life lesson is that you've pulled out of backcountry camping? That if we don't connect people to wilderness right now, you can kiss it goodbye. Right. Yeah, um, I love it, and. Chris, have you ever gone up to someone and said, yeah, you should try this winter camping thing. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's minus 40. It's yeah. just beautiful. And they're all looking at you like, are you freaking nuts? The yeah. only way you're going to convince them to love it is to take them with you. Yeah. They'll enjoy it. Even though they'll be terrified at first, they'll enjoy it. And then they'll go and tell someone else about it. And they're like, you're crazy. And then they'll take someone else. And it's a continual cycle. And that's what yeah. we need. We need people to, to take them out there to make sh- them feel or less phobic and make right. them connected. And realize we're all part of wilderness. Every single culture in this planet is connected. We're, we've evolved. We're born from wilderness. Take them out by the ear and get them to experience it and they'll, they'll get it. Yeah. And what have you personally learned as an author trying to translate those experiences into written works? 
I mean, for me as a writer, like, look at it. Like, I, I went, I was, I, I was a drummer, and I told my dad I was going to go to drum school in the University of Toronto to become a drummer. And he's like, yeah, that's, that's, that's all right, but I think you should get a normal education as well. So I went in to become a forest technician, fish and wildlife and parks. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I was in a band, but it, they sucked. <laughs> um, so, uh, what, where was I going? <laughs> Things that you've learned trying to translate your experiences into, uh, into the written works. Yeah, into, okay, sorry, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. there was a meaning for the whole drum band thing. Was I was a force technician, and, you know, it was a job. I worked in the bush, but I realized I'm just a farmer. Nothing to do with, you know, I'm not knocking farming, but basically I cut the trees down, I, and I planted them. I cut the trees down, and I planted them. And it was like, eh, I, I like being in the woods, but... But on the weekends, I worked in outdoor education. I volunteered uh, in an outdoor education facility. Right. And eventually, I switched my jobs and became, you know, someone in outdoor ed, which uh, then I, I started writing about it. And I went into, first writing experience, I went into a local paper, Milton, Milton Observer, mm -hmm. where I, I was born and raised in Milton, Ontario, in southern Ontario. Yeah. And went in there and I said, hey, I want to write a nature column called Nature's Way. And uh, the guy goes, have you written before? I went, well, I've written songs for my band. <laughs> and he's like, whatever, just write, write me a piece and see what I'll say. So, so I basically I wrote a piece on, on the life of, of an osprey uh, at the Wildlife Center. And he goes, hey, you can, you can write a good story. He goes, you're a terrible writer. Like your grammar is just <laughs> brutal. Uh, but we can fix that. So I wrote that column. It was syndicated column for like seven years. And then I, I, I wrote a couple of books and then I and actually my first book I walked into Boston Mills Press a small publishing company just walked in and said I want to write a book well who are you well I write this nature column I'm I'm Kevin <laughs> Kellen with the front of the fair in nature's way don't you know me and uh, so he goes well write the book that's the thing that's really important write the book I have so many people saying I want to be a writer then write the freaking book first and then try to sell it don't go, the first time ever, don't say, I want to be a writer. Have you written something? No. <laughs> um, so um, so I, I wrote a book on Clarny. And what was what happened in Clarny was I went up to write on, during my time off. I was you know, working at the time and then, and then um, I realized I wasn't getting the stories. So I lived there for two years and I got stories. I got the real stories of the real people that, that, that before I was just getting whatever you'd find in the library, right? Yeah. And yeah, then I learned the process of writing. It's all to do with interviewing, getting to know people, getting them to like you, getting mm -hmm. them to tell you the real stories, creating a story of it, mm -hmm. and letting the editor fix it. Right. So, but when the guidebooks came about, what happened with Clarny was at the, the last two weeks before publication, the, the editor goes, yeah, we're, you know, it's a lot of great history, but it's missing something. Can you write some ideas of where people should go canoeing and, and backpacking in Clarny? And this is in the 80s, right? This is a long time ago. And I went, yeah, I can do that. So I rolled it up really quick. And the next book was Cottage Country Canoe Roots. And they said, can you write a book about canoeing? Now, it was really interesting. It was like I had that time moved from Milton up to Peterborough, which is near Algonquin. Right. And I, on the weekends, I went canoeing in the Cortha Highlands, which is not a park at the time. It was just all these canoe routes. And I talked to the Ministry of Natural Resources at the time. And they said, yeah, those aren't canoe routes anymore. We're going to disband them. Oh. And even though I was like a young kid, I thought, well, that's wrong. And yeah. I thought, the only way I'm going to get people to paddle these routes is to write about them. So I went to my publisher and I said, got a great idea. Yeah. It's about canoe routes in cottage country. And he goes, well, you know, who would do that? Now, if I, if I was, I remember that moment I said, if I said to them it was for paddlers, they wouldn't have published it because mm -hmm. they're there to make money. The writers don't make money. Other people make money, right? Yeah. But I, and I knew that back then. And I said, it's called Cottage Country, Country Canoe Roots because codgers will buy this book. Oh, codgers have lots of money. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> so the, that's why it was called that. So then what happened is I wrote about all these canoe routes in Cottage Country. And now all those places were protected because all these paddlers came to paddle it. And I was yeah. criticized by some people. People still curse me for writing and promoting about, uh, about, uh, about the Corthus and stuff. But if you don't promote it and get people there, they're going to use it for resource extraction. Right. It's a given. Or development. Yeah. So you look at the history of time, like like um, all the, the people that, that were criticized. Well, Quetico was formed and people cursed the people for promoting Quetico. Now it's a it's an incredible park. Yeah. It's a, 
And so what's been the most rewarding thing that's come out of your writing work? These are really... Oh, my Lord, Christy's... Oh... Some really good questions, actually. Oh, man, that's wrong. Um, hmm. Well, two, two, two things. I, I think there's people like, I mean, I'm doing this for a long time. And not that I'm old, but I've been doing it for a long time. Mm-hmm. And I've had people come up and really, and this is tough. This is tough. You changed my life, Kevin. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's pretty. That's a strong statement to say to someone. What do you mean? How did I change your life? Yeah. Well, I became a paddler. I was I, I, I felt better about myself being in the wilderness. I've done this. I've done this. All because I read your book. I went, okay, so I don't know if I really did change your life. But I'm not going to tell them I didn't. But Because right. um, that's pretty strong to put on someone, right? Like, But wilderness changed their life. So I introduced them to something that would change their life. Something so powerful. So connecting, right? And yeah, at the end of my day, it's like, if I could do that, if I can introduce them to this magic called wilderness and to get them to become their real self and be, feel good about themselves, then that's fantastic. And the other is, I think it's amazing that I can actually literally say, I've never had a full-time job in my life. <laughs> like, really, I, 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 I mean, my mother's still like, oh God, you're going to get a job or what? And it's like... <laughs> But the thing is, I've always worked in the outdoors. I mm-hmm. never made a lot of money. I knew that going into it, I never would make a lot of money. But I'm very rich in spirit, not yes. in the bank, right? Yeah. And I knew that going into it. And if you don't know that, don't. I mean, you work in the arts, right? Yeah. 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 It doesn't happen. But but you're happy what you do because you 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 do something positive. Yeah. And I'm in the woods most of the time. Yeah. I can't argue about that. Yeah. And so, uh, is is that what drives you? What what drives you, or what would you say drives you the most to continue continue on doing what you're doing? Like, what 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 makes you want to get out there and write the next book? There's one thing I've been looking at. There's there's a lot of narth- narcissism in in the outdoor world, and mm-hmm. people are doing it for the wrong, wrong reasons. I really I, I don't want to change the world. I mean, that's impossible to change the world. But I want to make a significant difference of what I've done here. I get up to write because I love telling a story. I love inspiring people. I get a, I get a thrill out of that. I, I feel that I've done something at the end of the day. And I also um, think, hey, it's cool. Like, I, I actually have made some type of employment by being out, outdoors. So, yeah. 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 And, and what's your favorite story of all time? Sweet Lord! <laughs> intense uh you know my favorite story is a story i've told too much so i'm not going to tell that one again it's basically it's a story of uh jason that actually escaped on a trip because he was high on drugs and and then uh, that whole trip changed his life and i i think i have heard that yeah but i've told it too much and i think people get it like we get that one so if if you're not going to tell that one i'm going to tell our audience that i'm going to link to it down below because i've I've watched that, and it's it's pretty powerful stuff. Well, it proves that actually magic happens in the wilderness, and and it yeah. and it does. I, and I, again, I've exaggerated many many stories. That happens. Yeah. I could not believe that mm-hmm. I let that kid go and like wilderness fix it, and it did. Yeah. Um, and boy, you need that in life to actually see the real thing happen right in front of you, just like just like a stage, right? Yeah. Uh, I think my favorite story is telling the story. I love telling the story. I mean, there was a time when uh, Mr. Baxter, um, man, we did the Copper River. We paddled that for five weeks. And I did a CBC radio interview every single uh, uh, week uh, uh, weekend. And I saw, I think we saw 11 bears on that trip. And then so the host said, what about a moose? I went, I haven't seen a moose. I said, what do you haven't seen a moose? I said, well, I haven't seen a moose. Well, we don't want a story about a moose. I went, I know it's radio, but I can't make this up, Okay. And so um, we get to the uh, the end of the trip, and we drive down this dirt road. And our my last interview is, is at this fishing lodge with a radio phone. It's all set up. And on the way there, I see this moose on the side of the road. I go, hey, stop! I need a story of moose. <laughs> so uh, he goes, Kevin, moose are quite dangerous when they're with a calf near the road. I went, there's no calf. And, and I remember even saying, and never say this. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> never say that. Never. And yeah. I went to take a picture. And there was a calf, and the moose looked at me, and she did a charge. And usually it's a fake charge, so you get behind a tree and you, whatever. 
Um, but it was not fake charge. And I literally was booting down uh, down the road. And Andy, being Andy, he's like, come on, Callan, you can make it, come on. And he's yeah. laughing, and I thought, I'm going to die. I actually thought, I'm going to die. This moose is going to get me, I'm going <laughs> to die. This I'll get Callan's going to die in the north. <laughs> and a logging truck comes around the corner and then gives the, the horn, and the moose takes off in the bush. And Andy, and I got that on video at the end, like Andy's just laughing, saying, I've never seen you run so fast in your life. And, yeah. So we, we get to the interview, and I'm telling the story, and the host said, you know, really? And she, you could tell she's not believing this story. The locking truck driver phoned into the radio station, oh, and he goes, goodness. I saw him. i never seen someone run so fast in my life. <laughs> that was cool. That was a cool experience. I, I mean, you asked me what was my favorite story. There's endless stories I could tell. It's just those experiences. Yeah. Life at home is not dull. But I think sometimes we like wilderness travel because it's not dull at all. Yeah. It, it's not norm. Uh, it should be norm, but it's not. And I think we like it out there because of it. Uh, it gets you away from the mundane of A to B, right? Mm-hmm. I always written, you know, I've written all these guidebooks and, and I've told everybody how to get from A to B. But the true story is what happened between A and B. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <gasps> the fire is out. <laughs> Stoke the fire some more. Oh yeah, we should. Yeah, that's that's cute. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. just I can't handle these very I serious questions. I like it. I like you being on the receiving end of the questions. Oh, <laughs> maybe that's what it is, right? She's a bushcrafter. <laughs> no. <laughs> You're getting a little dark. Camera, are you getting this? Uh, Chris just went and got like lighting in the wilderness. It's called a lamp. How are you able to maintain such a happy, fun-loving sense of humor while you're out there doing such crazy things? Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I'm happy out there most of the time, to be quite honest. Um, it's our choice to be out there on a trip. Yeah. So if we, if we complain about the weather, we complain about the portage, it's our decision to be out there. So we most likely laugh about it as opposed yeah. to... Oh, we're, we can do it. You know, and if you go out in the woods, to be quite honest, I see a lot of this lately too. Well, not lately. It's been going on for years. They go out to experience wilderness for them to conquer wilderness. My God, if you do that, you're going to die. But then they check it off saying, look what I did. And then they go back to some other thing. They they start golf or they, they, they have a train set, whatever. I don't know. But it's just, if you do that, that that's fine. But that's not what canoe tripping or wilderness tripping is all about. It's it's your lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I can see that a mile away uh, when people come up to me at shows. And and um, one of the worst things ever to do on any of our trips is to want to go home early. Right. And we've had people on trip that have tried to paddle faster so they can get home early. I went, we spent days, weeks, months planning this trip. Yeah. We, we've, we spent hours of mundane time at work, like, dreaming of this trip yeah. why do you want to go home yeah. i got the term happy camper because i wrote a book that was a, a big big seller uh, called the, the happy camper it was a how-to yeah. book and the media grabbed onto that big time and then i was called the happy camper in the media and my buddies thought that was fine because the majority of the time i'm a very happy joel um person right yeah. so and so as the happy camper what has been your happiest moment out camping? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't... Like, there was just a whole bunch of memories. This is yeah. not one. It's not... But if you could go back and you could relive one, and maybe that's not the right way to phrase it, but... Well, there's well, many, but but I, I do... I remember the time going across Algonquin with my daughter. Um, we went out for 12 days across the Algonquin. And there was one night we were playing a board game. Where, no, it wasn't a board game. It was a... What was it called? That, basically that, that game where we had to make up stories. No, you don't... Oh, great. It was a great memory. I remember. <laughs> but you got a card, and you had to create characters from the card, and then tell a story around the campfire. Yeah. And it was very simplistic, entertaining, family-oriented lovely time in the woods yeah. you weren't afraid of the bear killing you you're enjoying the silence the loon calls and playing a simple game yeah. and no, that was a good memory uh going on a solo trip and uh 
just hearing whip rules around, around the, the, the tent and then finding that they're so loud, you want to go, shut up, shut up, I need some sleep. <laughs> Those are good memories. Uh, I, um, I love the, the, the times when just even the friends I pal with, like, uh, like a- my buddy Andy that's just hilarious on trip and then I find out at work he's a very serious person because he's a manager <laughs> of Species at Risk, whatever. And I, I, I went to present at his, his uh, workplace and... I showed a video of Andy and everybody's laughing and I went, he's not like this at work. I mean, um, taking youth out in the woods and watching that magic happen or even like years later, one of those youth people, you know, young people coming up to me and saying, thank you. Uh, yeah. And then they are in some job that's taking people out in the woods. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so the answer is not just one answer. It's just a continual. Yeah. Yeah. Thing. yeah. If there's one thing that you could share with the world, <laughs> the people that do it get it and and if you don't you need to go out like we like we've said before but um yeah. the best thing about back camping the, 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 there's there's times where you're like this is crazy like the, when the bugs are bad um the wind is bad and you're winter camping and it's minus 40 it's a lot better being out there though than just a really boring day at work really is you feel alive yeah. right so we need to feel alive because you don't feel alive and you're just so this mundane person in, in existence of what billions of us right in a crazy world that we live in uh if you want to change things then go out in the woods and it will change you yeah. right i highly recommend checking out kevin callen's books they've inspired many many people to go and enjoy the wilderness so yeah. I've only talked to two people that got lost reading my guidebooks. So that's good. Oh, that's good. Yeah. That's good. And it was all their yeah. fault, not mine. <laughs> well, cheers. Cheers. To that. <laughs> cheers. Thanks for watching, everyone. Oh, yeah, I'm stuck drinking that. It's really strong. It? <laughs> oh, that is. Oh, that's strong. It is. It is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>